Fuck that. I don't know, these people have work to do or something. I don't know what the fuck. All right, thanks for that. What is this for? I have to do a three-person video shoot tomorrow, so I'm going to do a try full Monty three-camera setup. With who? Brian and John Morenci. Sorry, two-person, but three-camera. We'll see how it goes. I mean, well, the good news is I've set it up so that. Uh, All right, you can just do a remote. So I didn't really find any topics because there's nothing really interesting. I couldn't find anything super interesting. I know you also have, you know, four topics, so that's or five topics, so that's cool. Yep. Where is this? Is it time to go? Yeah, I'm just doing it. Uh, it is 3.30 on the dot. All right. Okay. Let's do it. I'll leave that for now. Let me just bring this up. All right, good. Let me look at me. This is the only thing I want to do. We're good. You know what? Focus was fine. Do I talk for one second? Talk, talk, talk. Test, test, test. La, la, la. All right, I think we're good. All right, one is Rivian, two is Drone, three is Galaxy F. All right, good. April 25th is today's date. Because I always forget. Meet by phone. to myself. Here it is. One is, help me remind, Rivian drone. Okay, here we go. Should we go live? Yeah. All right. Make sure it looks good. Okay, ready? Let me rotate this so we can. We are live, it looks like. We're live? We're live! Hey! We're streaming. Hey everyone! Just kidding on LF. I know. You know, we're trying to do some stuff. We have no producer. We're being ditched by our best no. bud, Geo. So we're at a loss here. We're a little confused. So apologize for the false alarm on the initial start. I hit the wrong button on my keyboard. We're now live. We're so good. good. So welcome back to View on Tech. Today is Thursday, April 25th. And we've got... Happy Avengers Endgame Day. Oh, are you going? On Monday. I see. I know yeah. well, it's very. I know it's a very meaningful date for I you. Know. So I'm super exciting. I know. So um, the other thing we have, I thought that was noteworthy, is we have a stealth beer, a beer that we both tried to look on the internet. Or I found it. You did find it. Yeah, it's I right did. there in this um, mini growler or full size growler. What is it exactly? Uh, Tell us, please. So this is a brewery called Henry and Fran. They're based out of West Boylston, Massachusetts. Very, very small place. So I went there to pick up uh, a couple bottles of an Imperial S'more yep. Stout, and it also got a growler filk with it. Literally, they're in like this guy's shed. Literally, it's really? a shed or a converted like one car garage that now has like you know a couple big fermenters right, in right, it right. and a bottling station and. Yeah, and like you drive up there, it's a guy's house. His house is right there, and then there's this this shed, and it's all muddy. You're parking in the mud. I stepped in this big mud puddle. My sneakers got. Duh, was, but still, hopefully the beer's worthwhile. I'm sure it is. I don't know. So well, so I had the stout because this brewery has been very controversial uh -huh. uh, in the sense that you know it's a very small organization, uh -huh. and they've had some quality issues, oh. things like that. So you want to drink it as fresh as possible. So I picked this up on Saturday. It's been in the fridge ever since. It should be okay. The stout I had, it, it tasted, it smelled good, and tasted fine. 
and it, it was a little smoky, which was interesting. Interesting. But you think about a s'more, s'more is kind right, of right. made over campfire, which could be smoky as well. So either like it or get sick. Well, this one's different. Other. So this is uh, not a stout. I know, I know, but you said they've had some quality issues, so I hope we're not experiencing. Well, I know you'll get thing. sick. Like you'd be able to tell, like, you taste it, it tastes sour. Like it would taste good. You know? All right. Cool. Now this is called. I hope Parallel Universe Me is doing okay. <laughs> really? Whatever that means. I have Typically, no idea. What, I, what I've read about this brewery is that, first off, Henry and Fran, and it's not the name of the brewers. It's actually the name. These were Iraq veterans. Really? That started the brewery. And the name of Henry, Henry and Fran is actually an intersection in Fallujah. Oh, really? Yes. Wow. Very interesting. And the beers that they release, the titles of the beer, names of the beers, are always based off of like literature. Interesting. So I don't know what book or whatever this is from or what piece of literature, but it's called I Hope Parallel Universe Me is Doing Okay. And it is a sour ale mm. with tang and lactose. Sweet. Because lactose means lactose is sugar. Yeah, right. sugar. I don't know about that. And we'll tang. Try it you know, know Tang, right? Of Back in the day, the powdered orange powder. That was drink. famous when I was growing up because it was all about what the space people drank. And so Tang was sort of like the like drink astronauts? of astronauts. Oh, exactly. really? Is that where that came yeah, from? Yeah, totally. Interesting. So, first off, it's a sour ale. I don't know if you like sours. I've had sours before. It's okay. I, think, I mean, for a nice spring day like today, beautiful outside, yeah. by the way. We've had a it lot is. of rainy weather lately. It is. Just like it looks outside on our screen there, you yeah, can see, right? It kind of does look like that. Actually. Exactly. So, it's beautiful out there. So, we'll see. How this goes. And now, you did a lot of work today. You got most of the topics. I did. I slacked off a little bit, but also, honestly, I didn't really find a lot of interesting technology news when I did do you know, a search for a button. You need to know where to look, my friend. Well, I've got my reliable sources, and I don't have much going on. So I'm going to let you start. I'm going to pour the beer, and we're going to... So um, one of the things goes. I did today as well, are you on the live stream? You should be, because oh, not. what I did was I decided to up our game slightly, and so, in fact, I have images to go along with three of four of my <laughs> stories. Hey! Oh, my God. I so, the see. first one is a conversation relating to electric vehicles. Now, you're familiar with Tesla. We've talked, so am I. We've talked about that many times. But I'm talking about another one. This one is called Rivian. Now, I imagine most of you have not heard of Rivian. In the reality of electric vehicle world, a lot of companies, even upstarts, trying to make electric vehicles, many of which I think are scams or don't really know what they're doing. So I always assume that Rivian was another one of those. Smell that. It smells like Wow, tank. it does. <laughs> so they promise... 400 miles on a single charge in a pickup truck that'll be available in 2020, which seems like, wow, that seems like a real deal. So I thought that was interesting and intriguing, but what really caught my eye today is that, in fact, Ford invested $500 million in the company. So they went and they invested five hundred million dollars in Rivian. And I would say that makes sense. And before I do that, I'm going to jump over. You keep talking. I'm going to bring up the picture. So everyone should uh, now right, see I'm I'm a live image. We're a little delayed on the live stream, but sorry. Go ahead, Jason. I'm waiting for the image to show. All right, well, I'm watching the live stream. I want to see a switch. So you. It's, oh, there it is. There it is. See, it's got this weird kind of. Front light end. Like front that. end thing going straight across. It's kind of weird looking, I think. But yeah, I'm not a fan of that. The interesting thing is it supposedly does run on a Ford body. So in fact, they use the F-150 like underpinnings yeah. and they put their own stuff on it. So another reason why Ford would Pops think it's a good investment. Well, right, I mean, exactly. So I think also Ford makes the most popular pickup truck in the world, the F-150, or the most sold or something like that. And so... It makes sense. I mean, eventually, I mean, if you look at you know the way things are going with you know Tesla and all these other vehicles that are coming out, right? Then you know there eventually has to be an electric pickup truck. That's true. And in fact, they also have an electric SUV on the roadmap. I mean, it kind of makes sense if you think about it, because unlike someone like Tesla, who has to sort of reinvent everything, and maybe that's better, I don't know, they sort of have this partnership with Ford, yeah, so maybe they can the use like the frames and things like that, exactly, which might make right. it easier, right? Exactly, I agree. And maybe some of the parts suppliers, things like that. So I thought that was interesting, and that was a real validation, because as much as there are electric cars, there really aren't any electric 
sort of pickup trucks yet. I agree. And, you know, there's um, plug-in hybrid minivan, I think, is the most truck-like you can get. And I don't think the, the Model, Model X is really X. a truck. Jeez. Not really. Oh, they've got their other thing coming out. It's going to be, hey, cheers, by the cheers. way. Cheers. Have you tried it? I tried it briefly. How is it? It's okay. It's very flat. It's not really bubbly. No, all that sour either. Some sour, but not really sour. I'm gonna give it three sips, like a glass of wine. You know what I mean? So I've had two. I'll follow up with my third. So I'll time it with you. Oops! Hit the wrong button here. Sorry. Come on, screen. There, we'll go back to live now. It tastes like it's written. It's a sour ale with right. tang and lactose. Yeah, it's fairly sweet. It's com in comparatively. You mean it's yeah, not? Yeah, it's, it's definitely not like a pucker. Yeah. Your, you know, the back of your tongue, you know, taste buds really get triggered. But I think that's because of the tang and the the, the lactose. Um, it's interesting. Like, I mean, most sours, you want them to be sour. This one, like you said, is less sour. Right. So I don't know. I'm kind of confused. Yeah, well. So I got something else can confuse you. Okay. So my next confu story of confusion, because I'm always inter have interested stories, is what about, have you ever thought about what it would be like if you could fly like a plane that never has to land? And what would that mean? But what would you do? Like, if you could be in a plane that could fly forever and never land, you just be in the air all the time. That sounds kind of boring. I don't like, people don't like being in planes for like a six hour West Coast, East Coast trip. And you want to have them be on the plane forever? Well, so I think part of the the model here is maybe it's not a human, maybe it's an automated thing, maybe it's a sensor, maybe it's a cell tower, maybe it's wireless, maybe it is, you know, maybe there's a, a disaster, they need more cell coverage. They launch these things that fly around, or maybe it's kind of GPS-like. So this company launched this product, which in the company's name is what? I can I actually have a picture of this too. Um, the research at the University of the Highlands in the UK developed this thing, and let me show a picture of it, that looks kind of like a blimp. And let's hit right here. And what this is going to show essentially is a picture of this thing. And so what it does, it has a pump that has helium in it to float somewhat, mm -hmm. and then it has a pump that pumps in air. And so as the air is pumped in pressurized, it sinks. And as the air is let out, it that gets you know lighter and floats. And so the idea is it can pump this air in and out fairly rapidly and get a porpoise-like motion and basically just fly. But if you're on that plane, it doesn't like- I don't any, think you ride it, truthfully. It doesn't look like it. there's any passenger. No, here. it's more about you, instruments and things. I don't think it's that crazy, but yes. Yeah, I'm all, so, I'm all set with that. But I think the idea is pretty cool. Like, what could you put on it? I think they were talking well, yeah, about Yeah, what is something you would need in the air all the time, like a satellite, but usually you launch that into space. You don't launch right. it into the atmosphere. So could you have, like, a low-level satellite that does, you know, internet? Yeah. You know, could it be scientific? Maybe it somehow monitors weather patterns or winds or, or something. Right? It could be pretty cool, the stuff yeah, that you might be able to do. And of course it has, as you can see in the picture, it has solar, solar cells panels, on the yeah. wings and things like yeah. that. So I thought that was kind of a, a cool idea. It we definitely doesn't back. feel like for passenger travel it will be useful. No, I for, agree. like you said, a satellite or, or weather sensors or maybe even... Um, like a carrier, right? You know. Yeah, no, so totally. Either a cell phone carrier or like a, a, a FedEx carrier, right? Maybe you could use it for that, I guess. But those, but at least the, the, the if you're carrying packages, you would need to land because you're gonna get it from one. To right. One. No, I agree. And I wonder how this would affect like airspace with helicopters and other planes and things like well, that. Well, I think it goes pretty high, like higher, higher than that. Those? It reaches the protection which an altitude of twenty kilometers. Now, a kilometer is what, 0.6, I think? So that's 20,000 kilometers. So is that 12,000 feet? So it's not that That's pretty high. low. Yeah, that's pretty low. It's usually like the 30,000. Yeah, exactly. Let me just double check that math to make sure that right. And who drives 20, it? I think it's self-propelled. Self-propelled. To, oh, you know, to feet. 65,000 feet. So I was oh, wrong. that's high. I was thinking of kilometers to miles. Um, so that's not bad. 65,000 is, is well higher than yeah, most planes airplanes. Yeah, cruising altitude is usually 20 right. to 30,000 yeah. feet, right? So that's not bad. So you could have that thing cruise around. I think that's an interesting idea. I think it's an interesting idea and it's cool tech, but what's the application, right? So we have to right. figure out. 
So, okay, I don't have an image on this one. Sorry about that. Oh, the, I know, I tried. Actually, no, I looked at it, but it wasn't a good image. Okay. So, you know, one of the things that people really like about Teslas and sort of modern things is the whole idea of being able to have upgrades via software, right? It's a Over very there. smart car, and it can just be upgrades. Yep. Turns out... Like... Our Tifio SaaS platform, Tifio Go. Oh gosh, of course, of yeah, course. I, I'm, yeah. I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm running that thing. I, I need to, to promote it. I know. There we go. Can. Of course, the problem, or not the problem. Of course, that's really beneficial until you potentially get captured or trapped by that. Mm -hmm. And so the way where I'm going, which is unusual, is that there's actually a problem with that kind of architecture in the world of all things tractors. So there's a big story in Bloomberg about how tractors, there's a monopoly, so very few providers, and they're very modern and wired. You might think, well, isn't that great, right? I know once before it's gonna break, but here's the problem. Let's say your tractor breaks and it's the transmission, and so I call my local repairman, say it's Jason, and I say, Jason, come fix it. Jason's a local guy, he's really smart, he can fix it for me, he does it, I'm all good, right? Wrong. So because they're all computerized, if you want to make a repair while well, Jason can fix it, I still have to call the actual affiliated tractor guy. Manufacturer. The manufacturer representative yep. to go in there and say, click the button that yes, there's a new, there's a new transmission and it's working, which is a problem. Because what if the nearest guy is 300 miles That's away annoying. and you need this thing to plow your fields? Yeah, it's annoying. It's really annoying. Yeah. You know, and we have something here in Massachusetts, and other states have it as well, this right to repair bill, this idea that, you know, pe me individ independent mechanics should be able to fix cars. Evidently, they don't have that for tractors. And so part of the upshot of this is they're trying to get these bills passed so that they can get your local repairman to be able to fix it. Right. It doesn't seem right that he can't. Yeah, that, uh, you mentioned this story earlier, and I was surprised by that because if you think about farms and tractors, they're in more remote parts of the U.S., for example, right? You know, the Midwest. And it could be a pretty far distance, and you'd have someone come out to basically just approve right. a repair. Right. That's really what it is, right? You know, it's the, the, the approval of the actual repair, whether it's done by that guy or another right. guy. It seems definitely counterproductive. Right. But then again, with modern technology... Why couldn't they approve it remotely? Why couldn't they click the button remotely right, so and say, well, done? That's true, because if they're able to, if there's a sensor that reports, that calls home, we'll say, right, right. that says something broke, or is trying to say, uh, well, is it is it calling home though, or is it actually on the machine? That's a good question, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe that's a problem, maybe it doesn't call home, because again, very rural areas, and if it doesn't call home, then it won't work. Then you have to have right, a physical have have person. Now, yeah. now, Geo. It's like our, a dark site. Yes, exactly. Geo, our slacking producer, thinks it's an insurance thing and that most users don't own their tractors. That's probably in the contract. It may very well be in the contract, and they may not even own it for all we it's know. It's true because tractors are leased a lot, right? But the reality is, is if your tractor breaks down and you need to plow your fields or do whatever, right. like, how do you wait that? three hours, four hours, five hours for that guy to show up and fix it. Yeah, I agree. Um, so that's, it's I a think, is a problem. Butt. It is a real pain in the butt. It yeah. seems a little monopolistic in a bad way. We'll see, though. Well, yeah, I agree. I definitely agree. You know, if the manufacturer controls your ability to use your product right. or fix your product, yeah, that's super limiting. I agree with that. Okay, so then I have... Um, before I go to my last one, you don't have any more, right? I just I want to make one. sure. I oh, one. go please. So I found one that was interesting to me, and it's not super like techy, but apparently, if you're familiar with Holland, the Dutch, mm -hmm. the Netherlands, whichever one you call it, right? They have these beautiful tulip fields, right? And that's Gorgeous. where most of them are harvested for Easter and you know just year-round tulips, right? And people will flock to these farms. Typically, they're like, you know, in the northern part of the country where the fjords are and things like that. And, you know, travel there just to view the flowers and, and uh, take in the beauty. With the power of Instagram and selfies, there's an issue now. A lot of people are flocking there and actually walking into the fields and trampling the tulips. 
Oh no, they're beautiful tulips too. Right? So, I wish I had the picture for this. You could have put that picture up in the background. It's wow, beautiful. gorgeous feel of the tulips. Yeah, but so like, it's costing, you know, these farmers their their business, right? They, they, they this is how they make their living by selling these tulips to, you know, the flower companies or whatever, right. whatever the heck they are, right? And so if there are people damaging them and they can't sell them, then it's really hurting their business. And actually, one farmer went on CNN and said that. He had one field, and there were 200 people in the field taking Come on. pictures. That's like so people, disrespectful. Like, it's not, yeah, like, they don't understand this is, like, private property, I know. right? Maybe you should fence it. Well, that comes at a cost, right? Yes, I know. And, of course, you know, the way people are, they just jump the fence anyway, right? It would probably cause more damage when they jump the fence, they'll jump into the tulips. And, right. You know. But still, I found that, you know, the, the kind of not, not really, it's like the... Uh, what do you call it? The effect of technology, right? right? And the aftershock of technology right. that, you know, yes, it's great that you can share these beautiful pictures and images and, you know, brag that you were there, but it's coming at a cost because right. they're causing real damage to, you know, people's people's livings. It's so. true. So, like I said, not a super techie story, but something I found interesting in the news. Honestly, everything else this week just. You, you know, know my favorite story about tulips? You know about tulip mania? Tulip Mania? Yeah. No. Tulip Mania is pretty cool. So this was a story, a true story, from like 50 years ago. Okay. Maybe even further than that. And what it was, it was a time when people decided that tulips were gorgeous and incredibly valuable. So valuable, they became like gold. And so people... When, when was this? Many, many, many years ago. But it's this classic story, okay. sort of economics thing, where... People got so excited about tulips that they, all the tulip prices just shot through the roof. It was millions of dollars to get tulips because everyone wanted them. Okay. And so, you know, like like any sort of market explosion and collapse, you know, the price of tulips went crazy. Yeah. And then people realized, why am I liking tulips again? Right. And I went, ooh, and, and collapsed. So was, we like roses better. Remember? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, but at that point, tulips was it. It was called tulip mania. And it's sort of an interesting yeah. economic story of a crazy market that can go nuts. I'm going to look this up real quick. You should do it. Power of Google here. Tulip mania was a period in the Dutch golden age which contract prices for some bulbs of the recently introduced and fashionable tulip reached extraordinary high levels and then dramatically collapsed in February 1630. All right, so I was off by many years, but the point still stands. And it's very interesting about how that goes. It is interesting. So, all right, I have one more story, unless you want to talk about tulip mania more. No, I'm good. I mean... Was tulip mania irrational? It's a great story. In the yeah, no, like, yes, yes, totally. Was, totally. I mean, we planted tulips in our house probably a couple years ago. I, oh, is that where I got those from? And now they're gone because the squirrels and the chipmunks took them and moved them. So now, like, we had them, you know, we had them in a nice line and beautiful. And now Actually, there's I think like, they're on my my kitchen table. They're everywhere. Like, there's like ones in like the garden underneath a bush now because the guy because they took the bulb and buried it somewhere else. Other ones like in the backyard, you know, in, in like the the uh, hydrangea. Right. It's like. Uh, so, the the, the wildlife. Right, I, I know. But there you go. So my final story is about what we talked about last week, which is the Galaxy F. The Galaxy F is the folding smartphone from Samsung. The Galaxy F for fragile. Exactly, yes. and it went out to reviewers, and it the, immediately promptly broke. And so there have been a whole bunch of, there's two things that happened this week that was noteworthy about the Galaxy F. Mm -hmm. Yep. Number one, Samsung delayed shipment. So they delayed shipment, I think, for a month to try to address some of these situations, as you should. Yes. Number two, there's this famous company, maybe you're familiar with them, called iFixit. I know them. iFixit basically takes apart all cell phones, generally, and rates them for repairability. So iFixit took apart the Galaxy F, uh -huh. and let me show you a picture. Okay. This is not of the whole Galaxy F itself, this is just of one area. And what they found was, in fact, not what you might think, which is the um, the joint, the hinge, is actually really well done, Okay. really mature. But the problem is, because everything folds, and, there, and things, when you fold, sort of create folds, and things open up, as shown in the picture, creates all kinds of gaps. 
So the problem is there's a ton of gaps in the phone where dirt can get in behind the screen as shown here with that blue piece. So effectively, oh. dirt gets back there, after opening and closing a bit, it gets behind the screen and can break the screen. Yeah. So. How would they fix that? Because you need to have somewhat of a gap. I know. I was wondering that. Could you put some kind of sheeting or something that can move? But regardless, I mean, yeah. it's kind of a problem. And it feels like a, a kind of a neat idea, the folding foam, but kind of falling apart in execution, unfortunately. Well, I mean, it's a hard thing to do. It is. I mean? like, it is. Give them credit. They're really pushing the boundaries. Yeah, the technology that it's taken to even create this phone is amazing and definitely next level. But then it's something as simple as a, you know, a speck of dust. Done. Yeah. So, so you know, they, you know, maybe they can put like a piece of plastic, not at the actually where the gap is, but inside to prevent it. Right. I know. I was yeah. thinking that. But I don't know. Or like you have to get like some like piece of fabric or something to, like something that's very you know very bendable right and you just put it over that right that little gap there yeah I don't know I'm not gonna buy one anyway because I wouldn't be able to afford one anyway so well I well even if you could afford one I'm not sure you want to afford one is no. the problem because it's not looking very robust and we all know that our phones do take some level of abuse right and you can't have one that's gonna break immediately that's for sure that is for sure so now we're back to the live stream. That's really all I had. I think you're good too, right? I am. Yeah. Final thoughts on the beer? So you seem to like it. You're drinking it. I'm drinking it. I like it. You know, one of the things I find a little frustrating about some sours is when they're really sour, like pucker up kind of sour. Yeah. This is not that. This is it's actually not. fairly sweet with a bit of a sour finish. So it's not bad. It's not bad. I like it. For me, if I have a sour, I like the puck. You want you want a really sour. Ice, right? Yeah, this is not that. And it's not that. So I don't know. You know, it's not really for me. Hey, look, live and learn, right? So it's good to try new things. Back drinking beer, too, by the way. That's this right. Welcome back. back. With the beer. So Easter has passed. So That's good. It is over. Yeah, and so, so you, you survived. I did survive. It was actually a good experience. So wait, I asked you this earlier, and I didn't hear, not here, but up in the office. Tell me about the first beer that you had when Lent ended, because I want to know. What oh. was it? Well, the first beer I had was actually one of the bottles I got when I went to the Henry and Fran. It was at Imperial Samora Stout. Oh, because a stout. with Hen like I said, with Henry and Fran, because of some various things that have happened, you want to drink them fresh. So I was like, all right, well, this is the freshest beer I have. Let me crack it and uh, shared it with the wife. And it was, like I said, it was, it was good. I mean, I wasn't like, I didn't open it and drink it in like the heavens. Came, <laughs> those games were, you know, singing down on me like, oh. But it was good. I did have an IPA after that, and that was pretty heavenly. I was, I was like, oh, yeah. What was that? It was um, a collaboration between Other Half and Equilibrium mm -hmm. called Dreamwave Fluctuation. Ooh. And it was pretty good. Sounds very psychedelic. Yeah, it was pretty good. So... Well, I think that's all we have for this week. Now, well, you're back next week, right? Or are you traveling? Are you a traveling man? I'm around, I think. I'm around. Great. We gotta get another guest. So that, this, we had some guests lined up this week, and they chickened out. They all wimped out. Or if you want to be a guest, drop us a note, and maybe there's an opportunity for external guests too. Yeah, exactly. Jump on, hit like, comment, reach out to us. We'd love to have you on or hear what you think. Excellent. All right. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. See you later. See you next week.